Hello there, welcome to our lecture for April 4th, 2020. This is Dr. DeMaio for AHS 131 Section MB. And this is your lecture. Uh, we're going to be doing a lecture today on Chapter 6. And then I will upload another video on Chapter 9. Chapter 6 is, as it says here, is bones and bone structure. It's actually your osseous system. So last lecture, we did our first system which was the integumentary system. And as you saw in the integumentary system, that uh, it wasn't just one tissue we're looking at, we were just looking at uh, the skin and its accessories. Now this is bone, and there's several types of bone. So we're gonna describe the major functions of the skeletal system, classify bones. We've done a lot of this in the lab already identify the different cell types. We'll get a little more detailed on the types of cells that are in bone besides the osteoblast and the osteoclast. Uh, we'll be looking at the osteocytes and we will compare the structures and functions of compact bone versus spongy bone. We started talking about this in a lab. We looked at some models and we're going to compare the mechanisms of enchondral ossification versus intramembranous ossification. Enchondral ossification, as you can see, enchondral ossification is actually um, associated with making bone out of cartilage. Intramembranous ossification has to do with making bone with a membrane. And if you remember, we talk about <clears throat> certain bones in our body started out as a membrane, but most of them started out as a cartilage template. And we'll talk about remodeling. That's an actual term in bone physiology. And we'll talk about the homeostatic mechanisms of keeping your bone healthy. And we'll discuss the effects of exercise, nutrition, hormones on the development and the, and the health of your skeletal system. We'll also discuss the role of calcium as it relates to the skeletal system. <clears throat> Can't stop talking about phosphorus too. And when we talk about the bone as well, because you'll see there's two major hormones associated with calcium absorption and phosphorus. And then also it has to do with retaining it so that the bone can stay strong. We'll talk about the different types of fractures, how they heal, and we'll discuss the effects of aging on the skeletal system. So the skeletal system includes the bones of the skeleton, the cartilages, ligaments, and other connective tissues. The primary function of the skeletal system, of course, is support. When all else fails and you think about the skeletal system, you think of support, protection. Because think about the skull. The skull is like a helmet, and it's actually got a shape, kind of like a bullet almost, or a round shape to protect you like a helmet. And it protects the most vital organ, the brain. And then as you go down the spine, you see the spine is developed with all these pointy, jagged shapes that give it strength. So the shape of the bone is very important in, in its structure. And you'll talk about long bones versus uh, irregular shaped bones. So it's for support and protection, that's for sure. It also is a good site to store minerals. Like I said, calcium and phosphorus are two big ones. It's not the only mineral. And then lipids. If you remember when we looked at the anatomy of a long bone in a lab, the medullary canal has a, uh, is filled with a type of marrow. Do you remember what type of marrow it was? Yellow bone marrow. And yellow bone marrow is a type of fat. It's actually a yellow fat or brown fat, and it stores a lot of energy. It also insulates. So it can actually insulate the, the bone and insulate your body. We talked about the fact that if you had to put a rod in a long bone, that area would get very cold in the winter because it's just made out of metal. and There's no insulation. So it's storage of minerals and lipids and blood cell production production that's big blood cell production hemopoiesis in the adult actually after around age two or three all hemopoiesis really occurs 90 percent i would say or just off the top of my head more than 90 percent eventually is in your red bone marrow the spleen and other lymph organs um, were involved but not now as you get older, it's actually shifted to the red bone marrow. And we said protection. It also has leverage. It helps to form the leverage for the muscles. You ever see Geppetto, 
in Pinocchio. Remember the, the Pinocchio, the movie, the cartoon or whatever? Well, Geppetto had, he's a puppeteer, and there's strings on Pinocchio. And the little thing he holds in his hands are like levers. So bones act like levers for muscles, kind of like a puppet that has. All right. Bones are classified by their shape and structure. You can have short bones and so on. Let's look at that. You have sutural bones. A sutural bones are weird. There's another name. Do you remember the other name we use for sutural bones? It's called wormian. A wormian bone is a bone within a suture. It's like an extra bone. Like if you're looking at the sagittal suture on the top of the head or the coronal suture on the top of the head or the lambdoid suture or the squamous suture, you look at that suture and there's, there'll be a, an extra bone in between, like a little island of bone. That's called a sutural bone or a wormian bone. And there are irregular shaped bones, such as a vertebrae is the irregular shape, the ethmoid bone, the sphenoid bone. There's weird shaped bones, right? Uh, we also have short bones like the carpal bones. We have flat bones like the cranial bones and the sternum. We have long bones like the humerus and the, uh, the radius, the ulna, the femur. And we even said that the metacarpals and the, car and the phalanges are long bones, even though they're tiny, but they have a shaft that's longer than the epiphysis. And then a sesamoid bone is unique. It's found within a tendon, and the only one that is common there, it should be there, is the sesamoid bone of the patella, which is the patella. But sometimes people get extra bones in their hand or their foot that grow within a tendon. So in this slide, what do we see here from the top left? Can you find that sutural bone there? And then letter B, irregular shaped bones of vertebrae. Letter C, short bones like the carpal bones, flat bones like the parietal bone, long bones like the humerus, and there's your sesamoid bone, the patella. Now, sutural here, it says here, wormian bones are small, flat, irregular shaped bones between flat bones of the skull. The number varies on, amongst individuals. Irregular bones have complex shapes, such as, such as the spinal vertebrae or the pelvic bone. And here's an example of sutural or wormian bone. They range in size from a grain of sand to a quarter. Okay. Here's a vertebrae, which is a weird shape, right? And then short bones are more boxy, like the carpal bones or tarsal bones in the ankle. Flat bones are thin with parallel surfaces, such as the skull, the sternum, the ribs, the scapula. And then short bones are box-like, like in the carpal bones and the tarsal bones of the ankle. A flat bone has the very thin parallel surfaces, and then inside is made up of mostly spongy bone. So if you look at the image to the right where it says sectional view, you see two plates of bone, the top and the bottom, and then there's this trabecular pattern of spongy bone. In between those spaces, what would you find? That's where the red bone marrow would be. Okay, long bones are long and slender. They're found in arms, legs, palms, soles, fingers, toes. There you have a long shaft or diaphysis and short epiphysis. Sesamoid bones are usually very small, round and flat. They develop within tendons near the knees or hands and feet. The location and number vary between individuals. The most common one is the patella. That's normal. Long bones are relatively long, like I said. Um, the femur, and uh, this is a humerus, not a femur. Um, the femur is in the thigh. is the largest of the long bones and heaviest bone, but this is a humerus that would be in the upper arm. Sesamoid bones are found in tendons, and you see the, the patella bone is considered to be a sesamoid bone. Now we look at bony markings. We learned this in the lab already that they're very important to know, obviously from testing. You need to know those certain markings because that's where muscles and tendons and ligaments attach and also where articulations with bones occur. Articulations are important. And they're kind of open. There are openings. There are depressions for blood vessels and nerves to pass through like foramina or canals. And 
as you can see, a sinus is a space within a bone. It's like a chamber. Look at the middle top where it says openings. The sinus, the frontal sinus they're pointing to. But there's also a maxillary sinus. There's an ethmoid sinus, a sphenoid sinus. If you look to the right, you would see it's pointing to the frontal sinus. But if you look at the purple bone in the view to the right, you see a cavernous region right underneath that pituitary gland area. And that would be the sphenoid sinus. And we have the different foramina or foramen, fissures, meatus, canal. We went through all this in lab. And when we look at long bones, you have a head or a, um, a trochanter as well. You have the head, neck, surgical neck, anatomical neck, trochanter, crest, spine, line, tubercle, uh, sulcus, fossa. We went through this in the lab. Okay, so the structure of a long bone, it has a diaphysis or shaft. It's a walls or a compact bone in the central space called the medullary cavity. It's filled with a marrow. What type of marrow is yellow marrow? At the epiphysis, that would be the, the top and the bottom of the bone. You'll have a superior epiphysis and an inferior epiphysis or a proximal epiphysis and a distal epiphysis. Proximal means it's where it's attaching to the body wall. It's mostly spongy bone inside. And then the metaphysis is where the diaphysis and the epiphysis meet. In growing bone, there's growth plates. There's primary growth centers and there's secondary growth centers. The primary growth centers in the middle of the shaft or diaphysis. The secondaries are in the epiphysis. They eventually meet, but before they meet, there's cartilage growing there. And then once they do fuse, it leaves the metaphyseal line. So in this image, you can see at the very top, this is a femur. You see where it says spongy bone up there. That's where the epiphysis is. And then that's like an imaginary site right now because there's no cartilage there. If it was a growing bone, the metaphysis would have cartilage. So the epiphysis is not cartilage, that's spongy bone. And then you go down and look down to the next word there, it says metaphysis, that's where the cartilage would have been, the growth plate. So they're calling that where the epiphysis meets the diaphysis, the shaft. And then again, you have another metaphysis, another epiphysis, that would be the distal metaphysis and the distal epiphysis. So the structure of flat bones, for example, the parietal bones of the skull, they consist of spongy bone between two layers of compact bone. Within the cranium, the layer of spongy bone is called diplo. And we hardly ever use that term, but here it shows you the diplo is where the spongy bone is in the middle. Okay, and what we're talking about in the cranium. So then you have the cortex, which is the compact bone. So bone tissue is dense supportive connective tissue contains specialized cells it's solid extracellular matrix with collagen fibers now here's the key bone is not just calcium salts because if bone was just calcium salts it would be just like a piece of chalk calcium carbonate and it would just break it has proteins and the proteins are in the form of collagen and those collagen fibers help to make bone have this resilience and you'll see there are cells that are laying down this osteoid matrix and then it becomes crystallized with, with uh, minerals. The characteristics of bone is dense matrix due to calcium salts, like I just said. And there are osteocytes, which are the mature bone cells. They get trapped within a lacunae, organized around blood vessels. The blood is being brought to and from the cells through a elaborate system called the haversion system the canaliculi is a tiny little canal coming off the central canal so canaliculi are narrow passageways that allow for the exchange of nutrients waste and gas and like i said in lab that an osteocyte is going to live in a space called a lacunae and then he's going to have his pseudopods going out into these canaliculi and he can actually grab a sandwich from there and also communicate to other osteocytes pseudopods. So imagine they're like tentacles coming out into those spaces. And if the tide is low, they're gonna reach out further for some food. And why would the tide be low if you're not circulating blood and you're not increasing your pressures and moving? So exercise is very good for bone. 
in that sense. It's also good for bone and uh, other things. Now, the next topic there is one reason why it's good. Look at the periosteum. That covers the outer surface of bone, except at the joint. It consists of outer fibrous membrane and an inner cellular membrane or layer. So there's a fibrous periosteum and there's an osteogenic or cellular layer of the periosteum. The osteogenic layer tells you a lot more about it. And that's the layer where it will help to grow bones. When muscles attach to bones, they attach to bones through tendons. The tendons become inserted into the, through the periosteum into the bone. And it passes through into and through the osteogenic layer. When you pull on a, when you grab something with weight in gravity, it pulls that tendon at its insertion site and stimulates the osteogenic layer. So the bone matrix that's going to become bone is actually a calcium phosphate, not just a calcium carbonate. So there's lots of phosphates and lots of calcium. And that makes up two thirds of the bone mass. So most of the bone mass is calcium phosphate. So it's made up of both calciums and phosphates. Okay. So notice there's a PO4 times two. And there's a calcium three, right? So it's three calciums and this, this substance called phosphate. Uh, and you have PO uh, phosphate with oxygen attached to it. And there's two of them. So there's a lot of calcium and phosphates making up two thirds of the bone mass. It interacts with calcium hydroxide to form crystals called hydroxyapatite. And look at all the calcium in that. Lots more calcium than phosphate. And this incorporates other calcium salts such as calcium carbonate. Yeah, there is some calcium carbonate in there and magnesium and other trace minerals. A bone lacking in a calcified matrix looks normal, but it's very flexible. Look at that. Look at the difference between those two bones. Not good, right? Okay, so the bone matrix. Remember we talked about connective tissues. We said connective tissues are made up of cells, fibers, and ground substance. If you combine the fibers with the ground substance, you have what's called the matrix. So it's cells within a matrix. And the matrix proteins make up about one third of the bone mass and at one third of that bone mass of that matrix, excuse me, one third of that bone mass of the matrix is collagen fibers, which is protein. Very important. The bone cells make up only 2% of the bone mass. There's four types of bone cells, osteogenic cells, osteoblasts, osteocytes, and osteoclasts. So let's look at these cells. As we look at these types of bone cells, you already learned about osteoblasts and osteocytes, and I did mention very briefly about osteoclasts. But there is a type of cell that's a stem cell for bone, and that's called the osteogenic cell. So within the medullary cavity, you see a bunch of osteoblasts along the endosteum, if you look at figure A. Endosteum is inside the medullary canal, lining the medullary canal is the endosteum. Remember, the periosteum was on top of the long bone. So if you look at the center picture, you're looking inside the medullary cavity. They take a little window there, and you see cells lining up alongside the roadway there, so to speak, and it's under construction. And the osteogenic cells were, will become osteoblasts. And then figure B to the right is showing you how the osteoblasts are laying down what's called the osteoid. And then the osteoid secretions, if you look over to the left at figure C, the osteocyte is going to live in a space that was made by the osteoblast. And then he's going to live there and has his pseudopods going out into the canaliculi. To the right, figure D, or letter D in the bottom right is showing you an osteoclast. Osteoclasts are totally different cells. They come from the same origin as mast cells and they're loaded with enzymes. 
And so they can actually break down bone. They secrete acids and enzymes to dissolve the bone matrix. So coming out of this, we have a stem cell, the osteogenic cells. You have the young cells that secrete the matrix, the osteoblast. You have the mature cell called the osteocyte. And then you have the cells that break down bone. And the cells that break down bone are called osteoclast. And looking direct, directly above that in that image there, the figure B, the bones, the cells that lay down bone are osteoblasts. So osteoblasts lay down bone, osteoclasts break down bone. So if you're saying osteoblastic activity, you're getting thicker and more bone. If you're saying it's osteoclast activity, you're breaking down bone. Now let's take it another level. If you were looking at a bone tumor, and there's different types of tumors, some are actually blastic. So you have an oste you can have an osteoblastoma or a blastoma, some sort of cancerous disease that is actually growing more bone. Or you can have a sarcoma, and the sarcoma means it's eating away at bone. So osteogenic cells or osteoprogenitor cells are mesenchyme cells that divide to produce osteoblasts. They're located in that intercellular layer, the periosteum and the endosteum. So not only are they found in the endosteum, they're also found in the inner layer or osteogenic layer, the periosteum. They assist in fracture repair. So in the endosteum, you see the osteogenic cell. It could divide into osteoblasts. Osteoblasts are the immature cells that produce new bone, and they they uh, they form they they cause osteogenesis or ossification of bone. The osteoid is the matrix produced by the osteoblast that has not yet become calcified, and the osteoblasts surrounded by bone matrix become osteocytes. You now, you see an osteoblast here, immature cell that's secreting an organic matrix called the osteoid in blue. Well, the, it's starting to make the osteoid and then it becomes an organic matrix. The matrix gets now crystallized. The osteocytes are mature bone cells that do not divide. They live within the lacunae between the layers of the matrix and have cytoplasmic extensions that pass through the canalicula like pseudopods. And the two major functions of an osteocyte is to maintain the protein and mineral content of matrix and help repair bone. Osteocytes in a mature bone cell maintain the bone matrix. Osteoclast job is to absorb and remove bone matrix. They're large multinucleated cells that secrete acids, protein digesting enzymes, that literally dissolve bone matrix and release stored minerals. This osteolysis, remember we use that suffix, lysis means to cut or enzymatic activity or break down. This osteolysis is important in homeostasis because you got to break down old bone and make new bone. It's constantly under, we're constantly going on in our body. Remember what I said, whether you sit on the couch and eat bonbon, bonbons every day, or if you get up and exercise, your bone is going to change, and it will change accordingly. If you don't move, use your body with gravity, the bones will get weak. If you sit on the, bound, on the couch and eat and gain weight, it's going to cause a lot of joint pain. And it's derived from the same stem cells that produce monocytes. That's what's weird about osteoclasts. Osteoclasts are unique. They're derived from the same cells that form monocytes and macrophages. Remember we talked about wound healing. And you had these fixed macrophages and um, uh, other macrophages coming in. They engulf bacteria, cellular debris. They have lots of enzymes in there. So this comes from the same actual origin that would have made a blood cell called a mast cell. A mast cell. And in the blood next semester, you'll learn that the sister of a mast cell is a basophil or a cousin, whatever you want to say. So they're basal fills when they're in circulation, but when they live in tissue, they're called mast cells. So the medullary cavity inside the, the center of the uh, long bone has these cells lining up alongside it, but they're also found um, in different areas like the periosteum area. Osteoclasts are multinucleated cells that secrete acids and enzymes to break down bone. 
So when you say osteoclastic activity, what's happening? You're breaking down bone. Okay, so the osteon bum, 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 is the functional unit of compact bone. It has all about that central canal and bringing blood to the cells while giving you strength. So it has a central canal that contains the blood vessels. So the osteon is the functional or structural functional unit of compact bone. If I asked you in class, what is the structural functional unit of compact bone? What would you say? The osteon, sir, right? Or else you're going to be doing 50 push-ups. All right, so the central canal contains blood vessels and perforating canals. The perpendicular to the surface of the bone, these canals, and they carry blood to deep into the deep bone marrow. The lamellae are layers of bone matrix. So you have a concentric lamellae surrounding the central canal in circles like a tree trunk. In between many tree trunks is the interstitial lamellae. And then around the entire structure of bone it will be a circumferential lamellae. So you see in this image um, at the top, it's identifying an osteon and it looks like a tree trunk. And then there's another osteon and below that with a central canal where it points to the central canal. And there are lacunae, little spaces where the osteoblast would, osteocytes would live. In the central canal has blood vessels, both arterial, venual, lymph, and nerve. Okay. And then this image shows you, we went over this. If you look on the um, outer surface, you look for the circumferential lamellae going around the entire wedge of bone. And then in the center of each one of these osteons, there are the blood vessels. There's also lymph and nerve. It's not showing that. And then you see around the circumferential or the circumference of that entire bone is the circumferential lamellae. And then surrounding each individual osteon would be concentric lamellae. And then in between each osteon is the interstitial lamellae. And then to the left of the screen, it shows you trabecular compact, I'm sorry, trabecular what? Spongy bone, which is found within the endosteum there. Just a small layer. And then you can see the perforating canals with the blood vessels coming in transversely into the bone there. And then it goes to the central canal and out through the little tiny canaliculi, which they don't show well here. Spongy bone does not need osteons because it has surrounded by blood. And those little trabeculae are like framework, like a bicycle frame. Imagine that. Many of them set up like in a trabecular pattern and they have tiny holes in it. Those are the canaliculi and it's submerged in red blood, bone marrow. So it doesn't need a central canal to bring blood. They're actually living in a big lake of yucky blood, gooey red bone marrow. And um, the spongy bone lacks osteons. The matrix forms an open network of trabeculae, like I just said. It lacks capillaries and venules. doesn't need it because it's living in a lake. And then the red bone marrow fills the spaces in between the trabecula and forms the blood cells. It contains blood vessels that supply nutrients to the osteo osteocytes by diffusion. And then the yellow bone marrow is found in the other sites of spongy bone. It stores fat. So here's an image of trabecular pattern of spongy bone. And you can see the, the trabecular pattern there. If you look to the left, it took a little window from a section of the upper portion of the uh, femur, like at the femoral neck there. And it's taking a look at the trabecular pattern to the right. And you can see the tiny little trabecula, little spicules of bone, like or bicycle framework of bone and the tiny little canaliculi and then inside each one of those trabecula there are lamellae with osteons living in i'm sorry with osteocytes living in lacunae so imagine this what you're looking at all the spaces in between filled with red bone marrow and blood compact and spongy bone Wherever there's weight bearing, the trabecula will be thickened, such as the epiphysis of the femur. You transfer forces to the pelvis, it has to be thicker. 
So on the medial side of the shaft compresses, it causes tension on the lateral side. So you look at this image, it shows you how the body weight is being applied to the femoral head and it's tr being transferred through uh, on the medial side of the shaft. Yeah, the perforating fibers, also known as Sharpie fibers, they become incorporated into the bone tissue and they help the actual tendons to insert into the bone. They increase the strength of those attachments. So functions of the periosteum, Isolating the bone from surrounding tissues provides a route for blood vessels to travel through and it participates in bone growth and repair as the muscles pull on the bone it stimulates the osteogenic layer to lay down more bone. So you see an image here it shows you the periosteum it shows you the perforating fibers on the bottom there otherwise known as Sharpie's fibers. You can see an osteocyte within a lacunae you see the canaliculi. So there's actually two layers of the periosteum, the fibrous layer, and here it's calling it the cellular layer, which is also known as the osteogenic layer. The endosteum is found inside the medullary canal, lining the medullary canal. It's an incomplete cellular layer that lines it. Incomplete, it's like it's always under construction. You ever see on the side of the road, you know, construction signs I was driving from Pennsylvania once one late night and it says drive slow because my mommy works here usually it says men working in the past now they say that so it's always under construction and it's active during bone growth and repair in which we call this thing tall there's a term called remodeling where you're actually breaking down old bone and repairing it so it covers the trabecular sponge of bone it lines the central canal of compact bone and it consists of a flattened layer of osteogenic cells. Here you see it. So you see the osteoblast on the bottom and then you see it laying down an osteoid. That osteoid will eventually become the matrix with collagen fibers. It shows you an osteogenic cell, which is a stem cell. And then it shows you the osteoclast. Well, look at the difference in size of an osteoclast versus the osteocyte within its lacunae, the osteoblast lining that cavity, and then you can see even the osteogenic cell. So it tells you right now it's like a foreigner. That cell is actually a blood cell. It was originally from a stem cell for mast cells, and it becomes what's called an osteoclast. In bone development, ossification is the term for when we develop bone. It is also known as osteogenesis, uh, bone formation. So basically we're talking about the calcification of bone. Uh, it starts in two forms. Most of the body is made up of cartilage first. And by eight weeks, we're fully formed cartilage templates of bone, except the skull. The skull is made of a membrane and then that becomes ossified. And most of us, our bones don't fuse until age 25, most bones. So we talk about two types of ossification. The first one is end chondral ossification. That's how bones form in cartilage. So what you can see sometimes is a, a primary ossification center. The first site where the bone starts to ossify and some bones have secondary tertiary uh, ossification centers it depends on what type of bone and where they're located those ossification centers so the primary ossification center develops inside a hyaline cartilage of the bone and the cartilage gradually is replaced by bone and there's seven main steps uh, let's see. can we play that video no you can play that video at home on the other powerpoint so as the cartilage enlarges, you know, you start out as a cartilage template, you're about the size of a little lapel pin. You know, it's like the size of your fingernail, uh, baby, or for all cartilage, all the bones forming, and then it starts to grow. And as it grows towards the time of delivery, um, most of the bones are still cartilage. Uh, 
and they start to ossify. And as the cartilage enlarges, the chondrocytes near the center of the shaft increase in size, and the matrix is reduced to a series of small struts. So these enlarged chondrocytes need uh, blood supply, and they can't, the blood supply can't keep up with it, so they start to disintegrate and die. And the next step occurs is where you start getting a blood cell start to grow towards that. Interesting how our innate knows what to do. Our body knows what to do in development. Nobody has to tell it to do this. So the blood vessels start growing towards the, uh, the cartilage template and they start to form around the side of the bone and they form a, um, a sheath layer of bone like a bony collar, so to speak. So you have this blood vessels forming like a bony collar on either side of the bone there, all around it. And then the blood vessel will penetrate. And that's your primary ossification center. So you have a blood vessels forming a bone collar, and then it penetrates inside and starts forming bone in the center of that shaft. That's the primary ossification center. And fibroblasts are migrating with the blood to differentiate into osteoblasts and begin producing spongy bone at the center. The bone formation then spreads along the shaft toward the ends of the former cartilage model. Now, as it grows out, you see how the epiphysis don't have anything going on there. But what's happening is the bone is growing. It's being remodeled. And the osseous tissue of the shaft becomes thicker and cartilage near the epiphysis is actually being replaced by shafts of bone as it's growing towards the epiphysis. It's increasing in length and also in diameter. Then capillaries and osteoblasts migrate to the epiphysis. And now you start getting blood flow into the each epiphysis. And those are called secondary ossification sites. So now, step six, the epiphysis eventually becomes filled with spongy bone. The metaphysis, or relatively narrow cartilaginous area, if you look where the bone was growing in the diaphysis or the shaft, it started coming towards the epiphysis. And then another blood supply came to the epiphysis and starts laying down spongy bone. And there's a space in between called the epiphyseal cartilage. And now this cartilage area is the, called the growth plate commonly. And in a child, you'll have these growth plates until the bone completely fuses at an adult sized bone. And at puberty, the rate of epiphyseal cartilage production slows. So uh, it's a little different in males and females because estrogen has a more powerful effect on closing those growth plates. So estrogen will grow, close the growth plates faster than testosterone. Now testosterone makes bones grow and so does estrogen, but it also closes the growth plates faster. And estrogen seems to be the one that closes the growth plates the fastest. So at puberty, the rate of epiphyseal cartilage production slows down and the rate of osteoblast activity accelerates and as a result, the epiphyseal cartilage gets narrower and it's becoming more and more bone. And when the epiphyseal plate closes, that, that bone is fully grown. And then notice the very top of the bone, it always leaves a thin cap of cartilage. That's called the articular cartilage. That's preventing from bone to bone contact. So all freely movable bones will have an articular cartilage on it to allow it to slide freely. Now, the next thing we're going to learn about is um, we're going to talk about, let's keep going, we'll go past this slide. Here's an image of a child growing bone. You see the growth plates with the arrows. Those are the epiphyseal growth plates. Notice it doesn't even look like he has eight carpels there. You only see a few of the carpals. The rest of them are still cartilage. Okay, and here is an adult. Notice there's no growth plates between the edges. So bone grows in, in um, length and also appositional growth in thickness. Now, intramembranous ossification is the other type of ossification. Hold on. It's called 
dermal ossification because it's occurring in the dermis. It produces dermal bones such as the mandible, the lower jaw, the clavicles, and um, it's five main steps. So here you see the mesenchyme cells cluster together and differentiate in the membrane. So it start, this, the skull started out as a membrane, and then there becomes an osteoid building up in there, and you see the bone matrix starts to grow in these little tiny uh, centers, ossification centers. As ossification proceeds, some osteoblasts are trapped inside the bony pockets where they differentiate into osteocytes, and the developing bone grows outward from the ossification center into small struts called spicules. If you look at the image to the right, see it's making these little spicules. And by the way, this is how fractures heal too. And then the blood vessels start to branch within that region and grow in between the spicules. The rate of bone growth accelerates with oxygen and reliable nutrients. As the spicules interconnect, they trap blood vessels within the bone. And the continued deposition of bone by osteoblasts located close to the blood vessels results in a plate of spongy bone with blood vessels weaving in and out. And here's what the outcome is. You have these trabecula of bone with blood vessels flowing through there. Okay, so as bone forms and grows, it needs blood supply. We saw that. The nutrient artery is the thing that really triggers the cartilage to become bone. Most bones have one of each or have more nutrient arteries and veins. And they pass through the nutrient foramen and the diaphysis. Then there's metaphysial vessels that supply the epiphyseal cartilage where bone growth occurs. And the periosteal vessels which make that ossification around the bone, the bone collar. So here is an image of all the blood vessels in the bone, highly vascular. So blood, bone has an excellent blood supply. That's a good test question. And it's one of the best healing tissues in the body. If you get a fracture and you care for that fracture properly, lining up the different ends of the fracture and keeping it immobile, that fracture will actually heal stronger at that site than before. It has an excellent blood supply, excellent uh, healing rate because of good blood supply. Then there's also lymphatic vessels and sensory nerves in the periosteum too. So one thing people don't realize is that bone has an excellent blood supply, but also has an excellent nerve supply. Just let me know when you get kicked in the shins how it feels. You know it has good pain nerves. It also has nerves that tell things what to do too. So bone remodeling occurs throughout life, functions in bone maintenance by recycling and breaking down old bone, making new bone. It involves the osteoclast breaking down bone, the osteoblast laying down bone, and the osteocytes maintaining the activity. So normally activities are balanced. If removal is fast and replacement, bones become weak. If deposition predominates, bones strengthen. Here's the effects of exercise on bone. Number one. Mineral recycling allows bone to adapt to stress. Heavily stressed bones become thicker and stronger. Exercise, part particularly with weight-bearing exercise, stimulates osteoblasts. Bone degeneration, it can degenerate quickly. Up to one-third of bone mass can be lost in just a few weeks of inactivity. Uh, nutrition and hormones affect bone greatly. Minerals such as calcium and phosphorus are required in your diet. And you have to be able to absorb them. So if you can't absorb calcium because you have a lack of vitamin D, that's a big problem. Plus, you also need magnesium and other minerals, trace minerals. Calcitriol and vitamin D3, calcitriol is made in the kidneys, and it's essential for normal calcium and phosphate ion absorption. So you can't have enough calcium or phosphate, phosphate uh, phosphorus if you don't have vitamin D. It's synthesized from vitamin D. So we need to have calcitriol from the vitamin D. Nutritional and hormonal effects of bone. Now just to go back to vitamin D for a moment, you cannot and you will not absorb calcium in your gut 
without proper levels of vitamin D. So you must have vitamin D. Vitamin D is normal produced from sunlight hitting our skin. It gets converted and then the kidney forms it into calcitriol and then you can absorb. Nutritional and hormonal effects of bone besides calcium and sunlight are vitamin C. Vitamin C is necessary for collagen synthesis. That's really important. Collagen is one of the most common proteins in our body for tissues, tendons, ligaments, uh, your skin, your hair, your nails. And so vitamin C is necessary for that and it stimulates osteoblast differentiation. Vitamin A stimulates osteoblast activity. So too much vitamin A you have to take a lot of vitamin A to say too much because most of us don't get enough vitamin A. But if somebody was to overdose on vitamin A, they could get what's called raindrop skull. It looks like tiny little punched out lesions on an x-ray where the bone is actually being resorbed too much. Vitamins K and B12 are also required for synthesis of bone proteins. Growth hormone and thyroxine stimulate bone growth. Their sec and you know sex hormones, estrogen and testosterone stimulate osteoblasts. Parathyroid hormone and calcitonin maintain the calcium ion homeostasis. That's important. So there's a video I want you to watch that, but let's just go on. Now the skeleton as a calcium reserve, bones store 99% of the body's calcium. Wow. Remember what I said about calcium. That you can't. You can't digest your food even because the muscles of the intestinal tract won't move without calcium. Nerves won't work without calcium. The heart won't work without calcium. Your muscles won't work without calcium. So therefore, calcium is necessary for anything to function in your body. Also, it's the number one gene regulator in the body, the calcium ion. So the bones store 99% of this calcium in addition to other minerals. Calcium is the most abundant mineral in the body. Calcium ions are vital for many physiological functions, as I just said. So here's a little composition of bone, like a pie chart. You notice calcium makes up 39% of bone. And then the rest is 33% collagen, which is protein. A small amount of sodium, small amount of magnesium, carbonate, and then a big chunk of phosphate. So calcium, phosphate, and collagen protein are the biggest. There's a little bit of carbonate, 9%. That's, you know, 10% of carbon of it is 40% calcium, 33% organic compounds such as collagen. And then we have a big 17% of phosphate. Hormones and calcium ion balance, calcium ion concentrations in the body are uh, closely regulated by our hormones in our brain, home, uh, the uh, hypothalamus of the brain and the, and the pituitary gland and parathyroid hormone. There's four tiny little glands on the posterior side of your thyroid. If you had a thyroid gland, you took it out of the body, it's found in your neck and you turned it around, looked at it from the back, there'd be four tiny little nodules called the parathyroid glands and the parathyroid gland and also, uh, there is a thyroid hormone that's going to be involved as well. So parathyroid hormone and calcitonin. Calcitonin is the thyroid hormone. So you have PTH, otherwise known as parathyroid hormone, and calcitonin. They both affect storage and absorption and excretion of calcium. So the bones store it, the digestive tract absorbs it, and the kidneys can excrete it. So parathyroid hormone produced by those parathyroid glands in the neck increase blood calcium levels. So if your blood calcium levels were low and you're monitoring the brain, it would say, hey, we need more calcium. So it would stimulate the parathyroid hormone to be released to stimulate osteoclast activity. Now here's, think about this. We're talking about in your serum, right? So it's measuring in your blood. You have to have it in your bloodstream. So it's going to go to the stores which are in your bone. So it stimulates the osteoclast to break down bone. Why? Because when you break down bone, you release calcium into your bloodstream. You're releasing it into interstitial spaces 
or the extracellular fluid or in between every cell in your body, then it's taken up by lymph and brought to the bloodstream and then it goes through your bloodstream so that your body can utilize that calcium. So it also, besides doing that, breaking down the bone and releasing the calcium into the bloodstream, it can increase the intestines absorption of calcium by enhancing calcitriol secretion of the kidneys. So it stimulates the kidneys to produce more calcitriol and that makes you absorb more calcium in the gut. And it also stops the kidneys from releasing any excess calcium. So it's decreasing the calcium excretion by the kidneys. It's a three prong effect, breaking down bone, giving you calcium into your interstitial fluids, into your bloodstream, increasing absorption of calcium in the gut, and decreasing the amount of calcium you release from your kidneys. The calcitonin is another hormone, and this is produced in the thyroid, but from different cells that produce the thyroxine. When you think of T3 and T4, thyroid hormone, you're thinking of thyroxine. And thyroxine is the hormone that increases your metabolism, but this is different. These are secreted by specific different cells within the thyroid called C cells. And calcitonin decreases blood calcium levels because, by the way, too much calcium level can really cause a problem with your nerves, your brain, and your heart. It can really cause serious problems to die. You'll, you would die. So this calcitonin is going to inhibit osteoclast activity. So it stops breaking down bone and increases calcium excretion. So it gets rid of more calcium by the kidneys and it decreases the intestinal absorption of calcium. And this chart kind of just summarizes it all right there. You could take some time to look at that. So now what increases and what decreases, you can go through this and look through this. The thyroid gland. Okay, so now if you get a bone fracture and it cracks or breaks due to some physical stress, you can have even open compound or closed simple. Major types of fractures are transverse fractures, which go transversely, displaced fractures where a fragment is displaced from its normal position, compression fractures where the two end plates are compressed down on each other, like when you stand and smash a, a beer can with your heel and it compresses it all the way down. A spiral fracture is usually a caused by your foot being planted on the ground, you twist and spirals up the bone or an epiphyseal fracture, which is right through the growth plate. And then there's a common neutered fracture, a green stick fracture, and some common ones called Collie's fracture and a Potts fracture. We'll go over all these, right? So the first one you see there on the top left is the transverse fracture. As you can see, it looks like a transverse cut through the bone. The second one is displaced. Now there's a fragment displaced there. And what do you think? That's not going to heal well unless you do some sort of surgery to get everything lined up the best you can, probably with rods and screws and so on, or plates. The third one in the middle, the compression fractures, identifying a vertebrae being compressed. These are very common in the elderly with osteoporosis or a patient with a disease process in the bone that makes it very weak, like cancer or something like that. And all the way to the right at the top row is a spiral fracture which usually happens when your body is planted, the leg is planted, and your body gets a force that twists it and it torques it. So the bottom is not moving and the bone gets fractured like a spiral. And the bottom left is the epiphyseal or growth plate fracture. If that's a child that's growing, that's going to fracture through that growth plate. If it does that, that will affect the growth of that bone. A common neutered fracture is many different pieces. Again, another surgical consult. And the green stick fracture happens in children. You notice that's a, look at the carpal bones, they're really tiny. And if you did look close, you'd see some growth plates in the metacarpals. And you see a growth plate at the end of the distal radius there. And you see the fracture where the arrow is coming down. That's a green stick fracture, like it's splinters. 
So the bone is still flexible, but it doesn't break cleanly. And then the Colley's fracture is specifically talking about a fracture of the distal radius uh, and usually occurs with a fall on your outstretched hand, a foosh injury, F-O-O-S-H, fall on outstretched hand. And I have a story for that, but you know what? You've been blessed because you don't have to hear all my stories on these things. But basically, if you fall out on your hand, it is a possible if you fractured your uh, a wrist, they say he fractured his wrist, but it's usually a Collie's fracture. And that's what they would look at on x-ray. So never hesitate to have that x-ray done if there's severe pain, because it's very commonly fractured like that. Then all the way to the right, this is called a Potts fracture. And you're getting more than one fracture. You're getting a fracture of the distal tibia and sometimes the fibula or the... Uh, uh, the, the tarsal bones there and that's a really traumatic fracture and that's going to take a long time for convalescence okay then this shows you the transverse fracture this is showing you the displaced fracture you can see the pieces displaced there's the compression fracture this is the spiral fracture that is the growth plate notice the growth plate there where the arrows are it's fractured through it. It's kind of slid through this. Sometimes medical orthopedists will call that a subluxation. And this is where the terminology for subluxation in orthopedics and in chiropractic has a problem. In chiropractors, when we say subluxation, we are talking specifically about a vertebrae out of alignment pressing on a nerve. In orthopedics, when they say subluxation, it's less than a luxation, less than a fracture, and it's usually talking about through the growth plates of a bone. A common needed fracture is many pieces and look how the bone is separated from each other quite a bit. And then this is a green stick fracture in a child. And here is the Colley's fracture of the distal radius. And that is the Potts fracture of the ankle. So fractures are repaired in four steps. First of all, you get a fracture that's going to be bleeding because there's blood supply in the bone. Remember, the central canal and the, the canaliculi, there's a lot of blood in there. So you get a fracture, you're going to get a fracture hematoma. And then it forms a callus. And the first thing that forms is spongy bone. And then it gets uh, remodeled into compact bone where it needs it. So a fracture hematoma produces a large blood clot. It establishes a fibrous network, kind of like when you get a wound, and the bone cells in the area die. A callus formation, the cells of the endosteum and periosteum divide and migrate into fracture zone, and that callus stabilizes the break. There's an internal callus and an external callus. The internal callus develops into the medullary cavity. The external callus of the cartilage and bone surrounds the break. Here's a picture. Fracture hematoma. You see the break through the bone is bleeding and it creates like a swelling a hematoma. And then the second stage is there's a spongy bone of internal callus forming like a bridge to connect the two ends. And then an external callus of cartilage. So spongy bone formation, the osteoblast replaced the central cartilage of the external callus with spongy bone. The compact bone uh, repair bone may be slightly thicker and stronger than normal. So here you see this internal callus to the left, the external callus on the right, and then as it starts to heal, it looks thickened like that. And that could last for a while. And so bones become thinner and weaker with age. A thinner bone or reduction in bone mass is called osteopenia. And that could start at age 30 to 40. Women lose 8% of their bone mass per decade. Men lose 3%. The epiphysis vertebrae and jaws of most affected results in fragile limbs, reduced height, and tooth loss. Osteoporosis is a severe loss of bone mass. It comprises, compromises excuse me, normal function. And usually patients over age 45 and occurs mostly in women, 29% and 18% males. Hormones and bone loss are involved. Sex hormones help to maintain the bone loss. In women, osteoporosis accelerates after menopause because of a lack of estrogen. 
So you look at the picture on the top to the right, you see a normal spongy bone on an electron micrograph. And then you look at the picture on the right bottom where the bone become osteoporotic. Cancer and bone loss. Cancerous tissues release osteoclast activating factor. It can stimulate osteoclast to produce severe osteoporosis.